On behalf of the First Baptist Church family here in Pulaski, Tennessee, thank you so much for joining us for this worship service. We think you'll pretty quickly see that we are not a bunch of spit and polish professionals. We're not the most gifted people around. As a matter of fact, we make all kinds of mistakes. We're a long way from perfect. And maybe you can relate to us in that way. And that's okay. Because our belief is that God's Son, Jesus Christ, is the only perfect person who ever lived. And Jesus took His perfection and did something amazing with it. He offered Himself as payment for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit, and is right now preparing a place for us to be with Him. The service you're about to watch, hiccups and all, is not about us performing for God, each other, or you. This service is about a bunch of imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We have prayed that God meets you right where you are as you enter into this service with us. And if you're ever able, we would be thrilled for you to join us live and in person. May the living God be glorified in this service, in our lives, and in yours, now and forever. And again, thank you so much for joining us. children up here. You guys have must be really enjoying the summertime, huh? Been out in the sun a lot? Yeah, you have? I hear some people are going to the beach. It is... Oh, you have it in a few weeks? Well, the, it just seems like this is the time of year when we're all just getting tan. Everybody except for me. I just get burnt. But anyway, uh, one thing I want to tell you before we begin, um, if you want to go to Nashville Shores, there's a sign-up sheet in the glass hallway, so check that out. Um, we'll be going July 12th, so make sure if you want to go, you sign up in the glass hallway. All right, so this morning I have um, some things up here that I need some help with, and um, Jolie was really excited to help me out. So, Jolie, you mind just, you see, the, what was all the stuff you see on the floor? Food. food, yes, we got some canned food. Um, we got about four cans of canned food, and we have some bread here. Um, has anybody ever played grocery store? Like you're at home and you play like you at like you work at a grocery store? Yeah, like with cat you do that? Yeah, I used to do that too. And well, I want uh, Jelly, I want you this morning, just pretend you work at a grocery store and I want you to just pack up these groceries for me, okay? I'll give you a play by play. Okay, she's taking the bread, she's putting it in the bag. She's taking the cans, she's putting it in another bag. Jolie, why are you putting why did you do it that way? Because you could you could squish the bread. You know what you're doing. Very good. Let's see. All done. All right. We got one bag full of cans and one bag just for the bread. You know, I figured you would do it that way because that's what they do. They do at a grocery store, don't they? When they pack your groceries, they put your bread. What else do you put maybe just in a bag by itself? Chips. Chips. You might, you might squish the chips. Yeah. What else? What's something else that we have to be careful with? Eggs, yes, eggs might be something. Bananas, yeah. Milk, milk, well, yeah, I mean, it may need its own bag just because it's heavy. <laughs> but yeah, when we pack groceries, a lot of times we put bread in its own bag because we don't want it to get squished because you have to be gentle with bread, don't you? Because you'll squash it, and you don't want to squash it. You have to treat it nice. You have to treat it kind. Oh. <laughs> you have to be gentle with the bread, don't you? Yes. Oh, I hit, I hit it with my mic, sorry. You have to be gentle with it. And today's Fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about gentleness because bread is not the only thing you need to be gentle with. But we have to be gentle with people, too. What's it mean to be gentle? Not hit anybody. Not hit anybody, yeah. That, that wouldn't be gentle if we hit somebody. Exactly. Be kind to them. Exactly. Because... It sounds easy, right, to be gentle with people, but it doesn't just mean they're like bread and if we, like, you know, sit on them, they'll get squashed. But we have to be gentle with their feelings, too, because sometimes people's feelings can be hurt. And it can be hard for us sometimes, especially um, two times I think about that it's kind of hard to be gentle with people is, well, a few times, they'll make you mad, one. But also, if we share our faith with people, 
or if we have a friend who's also a believer and who is a Christian and they're not doing the right things and we have to kind of gently tell them that they need to you know kind of get their act together and start doing the right things because sometimes people don't want to hear that stuff and they want to argue and fight but we're told that we need to be gentle. We need to be gentle and humble and loving because when we're gentle, loving, and hum humble and kind, we go a lot further with people than we do when we argue and fight back. We have to be gentle with them. And if you read the Gospels and if you read about Jesus, you see he never won anybody over with getting in an argument with them. He was honest. But he was also loving and kind and servant-hearted. And that's how he, he reached people. So we have to remember that even when it's hard, we have to be gentle with people. We have to be um, not just physically gentle, but we also have to be gentle with their, with their feelings and their emotions. Because we need to show them that um, God loves them and that God loved and we show them that God loves them by us being loving and kind to them. And we're going to talk about that more today in Children's Church, but right now it's bow our heads. Uh, dear God, we love you and thank you for the way that uh, you love us and the way that you're gentle with us. And I pray that you help us to just um, learn to be gentle with one another and to just be gentle in spirit and to just um, show others the love of you. And I pray this morning as Hunter comes forward and um, just gets baptized, dear God, that you let that inspire us to um, just see how God has changed his life. And please be with us as we move into worship and help us, dear God, to just focus on the God that you are. And we pray that it's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Because without him we would be nothing. It's things we do bad that separates us from God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. By dying on the cross for us. to show everyone that you're a Christian and that you um, really want to learn about Him. Old Hunter is under the water and, uh, and the new Hunter is up. We want to make this more complex than it really is sometimes. Uh, baptism is not something that saves us, but it's a powerful picture of what God has done in a life through Jesus Christ. And Hunter, a few weeks ago at Vacation Bible School, made his decision uh, and had a conversation with Gina. And that's why we're standing here this morning. Uh, and again, uh, even though it's simple, it's profound because a life is transformed inside and out. Eternal destination is changed. Makeup has changed. Everything has changed. And that calls us to something very special. And that first step of obedience is baptism. And so this morning, we have Hunter Wilson. And you've heard Hunter's testimony through Scripture, or, or through the video, rather. Uh, and we know through Scripture that uh, it is Jesus is the only way that we're able to do a, have a moment like this. So, Hunter, all the things that we talked about in the video, all the things that they heard, uh, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, asking for forgiveness of your sins? Yes, sir. All right. Then it's my privilege to baptize you today. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of Christ. Raised to walk in a new life in Him. Today, maybe you need to get your life right before the Lord. And the way that you do that is through the Son. No other way. Being here, baptism, just being a good person, the only way is through Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection and our trusting in Him for our salvation. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we thank You so much for the grace, for the mercy, for the love that You demonstrated through Your Son, through His death. That Father, as we celebrate baptism, 
that we understand that the old has to go away and the only way that the new come new comes is because of him so father this morning as we step into our time when we worship you let that be on our lips let that be in our hearts let that be in who we are as we leave this place later that in all ways we might glorify you and that first step be to trust in you through your son jesus christ we ask all that in his name amen amen let's stand as you're able and let's worship with the hope of Christ that we have in our hearts.
And then we remember that through his sacrifice, his love never fails, it never gives up, and it never leaves us. So let's sing One Thing Remains. Never fails, it never gives up. 
Father, we bow before you, acknowledging your greatness and your holiness, Lord. We just thank you for blessing us with this time together. Lord, we, we thank you for allowing us to witness young Hunter's commitment to the Lord. And Father, we just ask you veil him and you veil him from the enemy, Lord, and that you give heavenly wisdom and guidance to those around him, that he be brought up to be a man that brings honor and glory to you. Lord, we just ask your blessings on these offerings, Lord. We ask for your wisdom and guidance that they be used to bring honor and glory to your name. Father, forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, the choir just sang a song that had the words, We look behind it all you've done. We look behind it all you've done. We trace the path on which we've come. It's kind of an interesting thought to look behind and try to trace our path. When you think about the fact that all of us are in this room together today, in this moment right now, and you try to trace how we ended up here, there are a lot of decisions that each of us made this morning, this week, um, that, that brought us to here. But when you think about the fact that our parents made decisions that impacted us being here, not just because they were involved in the church or, or whatever like that, but our parents made decisions, their parents made decisions, their ancestors and their ancestors' ancestors made decisions for us to be here today. There was some shy boy overseas that had to work up the courage to go talk to some cute girl somewhere that resulted in you or me being here today. It's pretty, it's pretty staggering to think about how many decisions went into us being in the same room at the same time on the same day. Literally, for each of us, millions upon millions upon millions of decisions got made for us to share this moment right now. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling. It's kind of staggering, really, when we think about it. We trace the path on which we've come. But the line before that was... We look behind at all you've done. See, for us as Christians, and Baptists are just kind of a, a, a special flavor of Christians, for us as Christians, we believe that there is a living God who has eternally existed and will eternally exist as Father, Son, and Spirit. And that these events of our lives and the events of human history don't just happen by chance. These are not just random occurrences. That, that the unseen hand of God at times is in many ways orchestrating the events on planet Earth to fulfill His purposes. So yes, we have choice, and yes, that, that shy guy overseas somewhere talking to that girl he was intimidated about, uh, wherever that couple was, resulted in us being here, but that didn't happen outside of God's control. Out of, out of the boundaries that he set up and allowed to advance his higher purpose. And, and really when you get right down to it, especially when you start thinking about the difficult things in this world, the war and the famine and the plagues and the pain, not just way out there over there somewhere, but some, some of us this week, for instance, have had to deal with very, very difficult things and continue to deal with difficult things and with our health, with our family and our spiritual lives or whatever. And none of these things we believe escape God's notice. None of these things we would believe are outside of His plan. And so God is, God is working and He's moving to do things only He fully understands. That's, that's what we as Bible-believing Christians rely on and trust in. And we're going to take a few moments this morning to reflect on some of the things God has done, particularly those things that He has done through His Son, some of them. And we don't have time, of course, to rehearse all that, but some of those things that He's done through Jesus that have brought us to this moment. And something I would ask you to do, just kind of in the back of your mind, the middle to the back of your mind, is, as we're walking through some of this stuff, ask yourself the question, why? Why would God do these things? Why, why would Jesus, the Son of God, be about these things? What would motivate these actions that, that He's doing? What God has done for us began actually in eternity past. 1 Peter 1.20 Jesus is who the he was here. 
was chosen before the foundation of the world. Now, who, who chose him? The Father chose him. The Spirit, in a way, chose him. You know, before there was time and space in the universe, there was only God. A biblical worldview says that only God existed. There was no heaven. There were no stars. There was no earth. There were no animals. There were no people. Just God existed. And, and it, it, we don't have the ability to understand all that this is. But before there was even time and space that God created to work in, He existed. Before Abraham was, I am, He says. So within a, a conversation, if you could call it that, as if they needed words, which they don't, because God is spirit. And of course, He would understand the thoughts of within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit communicating. They formed a plan that involved creation and involved humanity and involved the inevitable fact that you and I would choose sin. Hunter, in his baptism today, before he was baptized, we're supposed to see, as Brother Rodney mentioned, a picture of the old life, of the old self. What's that about? We're identified with our sin. That's what that is. So God knew that, and he made a plan knowing that, and then he set that plan into motion that would involve making a way for redemption. But in an eternity past, Jesus was chosen to fulfill a certain purpose in our redemption. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at these end times, these last times for us, for you, for me. So in an eternity past, God set this thing in motion. He decreed that these things would be. For everything was created in Him, or by Him. So this is talking about Jesus. Everything, so now they, they hatch this plan, if you will, in eternity past. Everything was created by him, Jesus, is the agent of creation, on heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, those speak to the angelic leadership structure and even maybe the human leadership structure. All things have, created, have been created through him. He was the agent of creation and for him. So he made the plan. He executed the plan, and the plan eventually is for him that we are created. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. The word of his power, some translations say. It's pretty, pretty compelling here. So the plan that God set into motion now allows us, through Jesus, to have not only physical life that we enjoy today, but the opportunity to have eternal life as well. So that would one day culminate in us seeing him face to face and being as he is, having a face to face relationship with him. So through Christ, all these things are possible. Now, the Old Testament helps us see some things about who Jesus is. Of course, there's, there's a saying in, in sort of Bible study circles that the Old Testament has things concealed, and in the New Testament, they're now revealed. And Jesus is one of those revelations from God, the mystery that was, that was hidden but shared in, at the appropriate time. So when you think about Jesus in the Old Testament, there are many, many sort of glimpses we get, prophecies about the Messiah and the King of David and, and mentions of the covenant and things like that. One of, one of the big things that we see um, in the Old Testament about Jesus has to do with the angel of the Lord. If you've been in Bible study for very long at all, you've probably bumped into this, this idea of the angel of the Lord. Now, not every time in the Old Testament angel of the Lord is mentioned is it a reference to Jesus, but most of the time when it says the angel of the Lord, you're talking about the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ before he took on flesh. He manifested his presence and among humanity. So in an eternity past, he was working. In the Old Testament times, he's working. The angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Son of God, in Genesis 16, rebuked Sarah's maidservant, Hagar, and said, basically, get back with the program. The angel of the Lord speaking to Hagar. The angel of the Lord in Genesis 22 stayed Abraham's hand. 
He stopped him from sacrificing Isaac. You may remember that, Genesis 22. In Genesis 32, Jacob, whose name would be changed to Israel, which sounds familiar to us, who would basically become the father of the nation, down from Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, like that. But Jacob wrestled with the angel of God about the Lord's purposes. Israel means wrestling or those who wrestle with God. That's what Israel means. He's, the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. Jesus was talking to Moses, we can understand. That's, that's pretty interesting. He counseled Joshua outside of Jericho in Joshua chapter 5. So the idea that I'm trying to underscore here is that Jesus has been active in an eternity past. He was active in the Old Testament in very practical, involved ways to prepare God's people to receive covenant blessings. He was laying the framework, he was laying the tracks, if you will, that these things could run on, that, that the, the plan of God could unfold along. Well, the Eternal Father, again, and the Holy Spirit in an eternity past that agreed to this plan and their roles within this plan intend for us to see hints of Jesus all through the Old Testament. The animal skins that covered Adam and Eve after they sinned give us a, a foreshadowing of Christ's death, for instance. The ark that carried Noah and his family to safety show us Christ. You can't help but think of the wood of the ark reminding us of the cross. But certainly Jesus is pictured as the one who delivers us. The Passover lambs in Egypt. Do you remember when the children of Israel were captive in Egypt and, and God spoke, through, spoke to Moses and said to kill these lambs and paint their blood over the doorpost, the Passover lambs they would come to be known as? Remind us of the Lord. They're, now they're out in the wilderness wanderings. I think Brother Rodney shared this a little bit a few weeks ago. Um, in one of his messages, he was talking about the bitter water at Mara. You remember the tree that gets cut down and thrown in the water? That's a foretaste of Jesus, a foreshadowing of him as well. The bronze serpent that was lifted up, you remember that? And Jesus would say in the New Testament, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So we're supposed to see all these hints of things that, that, that we would come to more fully understand in Christ. Then we get over to the New Testament. I'm going to read these. I won't put them up on the screen just because the pictures help us see some of these things. But Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. When the time came to completion, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Hunter quoted Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. We're under a death sentence. The law has judged us guilty because we haven't fulfilled all of the requirements of it. So those born under the law, meaning those who would have to be absolutely perfect to merit our own salvation, have failed. Those who are born under the law, this says, when the time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. It's pretty powerful. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8. Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage, emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So are you, are you catching sort of the vision and the idea that in an eternity past, God had you in mind and me in mind? Before we had done anything or said anything or thanked Him for anything or praised Him for anything or we had been good or we had been bad, God set this plan in motion. And in the Old Testament... Jesus was very active in the affairs of humanity, at work, even showing up at times 
to speak with people and do things. And then in the New Testament, he takes on our likeness and becomes obedient to the point of death, fulfilling the requirements of the law. It's pretty powerful to, to sort of think in our minds back about what's brought us to here. Jesus was born in an obscure village to a peasant woman with a bad reputation. We revere Mary. We don't worship her like some might be inclined to do, but we admire her. She's a godly woman. But in her community, being pregnant outside of wedlock was not something that was um, well accepted, widely accepted in her day. So she was ridiculed and she was mocked and she was whispered about. So he was born in this obscure village in some out of the way town. Lived there with his mom who was whispered about in her community. Just after he was born, the local king there tried to kill him, you may remember. Think about this. He worked 30 years in obscurity in a carpenter shop, basically. 30-ish years. Whenever uh, Joseph encouraged him to come to the shop and work. So he's, he's working sometime in the first 30 years of his life, roughly, in this carpenter shop. Sawdust flying everywhere. Trying to fit pieces of wood together, whatever it is. His siblings misunderstood him. Just think about, think about what his life was like. Just the daily sort of grind of his life. Walking to get water, no outdoor plumbing, whatever that is, kicking dust around, being misunderstood by his family. His hometown mocked him. A prophet has honor everywhere but his hometown. Remember that? His hometown didn't understand him. So think about Jesus as a human being taking on our flesh, the life he lived, the daily grind, the dirt, the misunderstanding, the isolation that he felt in some respects, the rejection that he experienced. His people rejected him. When he stepped onto the scene to minister, they rejected him. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, they said, and they laughed. Just think about, think about the real Jesus, not, not the one that you think, oh, you know, he's God in the flesh so he can handle it. Uh, but the, the, the daily grind of what he was feeling. He was tempted by Satan in the desert for 40 days. Think about that. Having Satan's undivided attention for 40 days in your life. What would that be like? It would be horrible. We couldn't stand up to it. He spent time with adulterous women, crooked politicians, self-absorbed rich people, bitter poor people. He spent time with them. He put his hand on a leper. Would you do that? I wouldn't. He put children on his lap when children were viewed as a nuisance. He confronted hypocritical leaders. He listened to beggars. He wept when a friend died. He was absolutely cheered as he rode a donkey into town by the same people who were days later say, crucify him. Yell it, crucify him. He had his last meal with someone he knew would betray him to death. His friend pledged allegiance to him with gusto and then slept while he agonized in the garden. They scattered when the police came. Then they denied even knowing him. He was pronounced guilty when he was innocent. And a guilty man was set free. He was stripped and whipped and spit on and mocked and ended up carrying his own blood-stained cross to a hill where he would choose to die. A hill, by the way, that he created on a tree that he made with thorns that came from the curse way back there when Adam and Eve sinned. You think about that. In Genesis, the first three chapters of the Bible, he saw all that was made was good. 
Adam and Eve sin, he cursed the ground and tells man that he's going to have to work that ground and fight those thorns, knowing that those thorns would one day grow up and be that mocking crown on his, on his head. He knew that. He was nailed on that cross between two thieves and looked down from the cross at his weeping mother, but also watched soldiers gamble for one of his only earthly possessions, a cloak. From that cross, he would say something that none of us would say. We thought about this a little bit Wednesday night at prayer meeting, actually. Father, forgive them. If they don't know what they're doing. Would you say that? I wouldn't. There is no way. I would have called down every angel from heaven with their best flaming swords, and I would have laid waste. That's what I would have done. Who do you people think you are? But that's not who he is. That's not how he works. A few minutes ago, each of us sort of thought about all the decisions that we've made and others have made to, to kind of get us to this moment. These things seem kind of random to us, these events, but they're not to a sovereign God. They're not. And the events that he set in motion that we look around, not just in our personal lives and in our family's life, but in the bigger scheme of humanity, they look like they're just out of control. They look like they're completely random, but they're not. And God is at work. He has done so much for us. So many things, in fact, that they might be likened to the, the sand on the seashore. In the Psalms it says, when we consider your thoughts... They're, they're just too numerous for us. These things that you've done, they would outnumber the sand on the seashore. Think about each grain of sand on a beach, much less all the world's beaches. And that's, that's just a drop in the bucket for what the Lord's done for us. Psalm 40, verse 5. Lord my God, you have done many things. Your wonderful works and your plans for us. None can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they're more than can be told. Do you have a sense of that in your own life? That God is that interested in, in relating to you? That he's done all these millions upon millions of countless basically things to have a relationship with you? The psalmist in that psalm helps us understand that. Job Chapter 5, verse 9, he does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number. The gravity of that, the weight of that, that he, he is that passionate and that intentional, that focused, that he is doing that many, those many things for us, that much work for us. It's mind-boggling. Why would he do it? I ask you to sort of think about that. Why would he do it? Why would God do these innumerable things through His Son, particularly, we're thinking about today? Well, you, you might say that His ultimate goal, if you want to be really theologically proper, is His own glory. Because let's, let's just say for a second that we are to... Um, we are to elevate, we know this, but we, we put in a glass case something that's precious to us. We put in, we put in our um, fire safes, documents that are important to us. So we know that, that, that important things, valuable things are supposed to be lifted up and protected. Well, if there's nothing better than God, then ultimately He deserves all of our reverence. He deserves all, He deserves to be lifted up. So it's right for us to think he's doing all these things for his own glory. Now, if you and I did that, that would be self-serving in a bad way. But given who he is, it's completely appropriate. So we could say that he's done it for his glory. That would be true. But what was his motive? You know, what drove him to do these things? Love. 
is what drove him to do these things. Love. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. For while we were still helpless at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. And God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, his son, Christ Jesus, died for us. The Father has love for us that's expressed through his son. The Son has love for us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. The Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. And by the way, I think this is a very important point. That the Son of God, yes, died out of love for us. But the bigger love, as if there is such a thing, there's not such a thing, but... But his death for us in love was connected to his love for his heavenly father. He was offering, now think about this, we are a gift of love that he bought with his blood to give to his father. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful. Another sermon for another day. A fragrant sacrificial offering to God. Jesus in the upper room discourse said, I am going away so that the world may know that I love the father. And then he says at the end of this little passage right here, he said, get up, let's get to it basically. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of these guys who are going to kill him. But I'm doing this out of love for my Father, out of obedience to Him. And that plan way back here, let's get to it. Get up and let's get going, he says at the end of this little passage. It's pretty amazing. We're, this is week number four of our Summer Scary Verses series. And you know what today's scary verse is? It comes from John chapter 13. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. That's terrifying. Based on what we've talked about this morning, based on what you've experienced, what you've read, your devotional times, what words would you use to describe Jesus' love? I'm going to bore you with my list. These are the words I wrote down. And there, there are more, of course. Active, beautiful, benevolent, cleansing, comforting, compassionate, courageous, creative, credible, decisive, dedicated, discerning, doubting, his love was doubted, empowering, extraordinary, faithful, forgiving, freeing, friendly, gentle, our word of the day with the children's moment, helpful, humble, impartial, incorruptible, inexhaustible, infallible, inspiring, kind, liberating, misunderstood, modest, patient, perfect, protective, pure, questioned, real, restoring, safe, sincere, teaching, tender, tranquil, trustworthy, truthful, unconditional, unexplainable, unflinching, unselfish, wholesome, and my two big words, sacrificial and deliberate. Those are the words I came up with. So, when I think about him asking me this, Tony, as I have loved you, all those words you just used, do you love that way? Makes me want to cry. And then it makes me want to pray. Lord, help me love because I can't do that and he says you're right you can't but all things are possible with me and if I'm at work in your heart and I'm at work in your life then your life and your love can look more that way if somebody was asked to describe you, would they use the word love at all? She's loving, or he's loving. Would they even use that word? That's pretty staggering to think about. Well, maybe if they described us as loving people, what do we have love for? 
2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us that we can love a bunch of different stuff. Know this, difficult times will come in the last days. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying His power, and the passage ends, avoid these people. Which, which side of that line would we be on in our community here as a church? Those are people who are sacrificial and intentional and this and that and whatever. Or these people that, absor that are self-absorbed and lovers of pleasure and lovers of money who have a form of godliness but deny its power. Who are we as a church? Who are you? Because the church is people. Who are you? Why? For all of us, either we're trying to do it on our own and we're failing, or we either have never been transformed by the love of God in Christ, and we can't. The Holy Spirit hasn't moved into our lives to help us love that way. So either that's true, or we've gotten cold and callous to the point that we're not abiding in Christ. I had John chapter 15 in my mind about the vine, the branches, connected to Him, bearing much fruit. We're not connected to Him. Are you abiding in the vine? You know, are you praying? Are you confessing? Are you memorizing Scripture? Are you, you being still before the Lord? I mean, if we, if, we're, if we care about what this verse says, as I have loved you, so you should love one another, if we care about the pleasure of God, if we want to be the kind of people that obey out of love, that we, we love... We love each other out of love for Him. He is important enough to me that I love you. Just like Jesus said, I'm going to get up and do this to show my love, not primarily for you, but for Him. He is worth me loving you. He is worth us loving this community. Are we doing that? I, I pray that we can. I, we are in some measures as a church doing that. And there are a lot of really exciting things happening. But we could do better. And those of us who have felt the nudge from the Holy Spirit in, this, in these moments, we know who we are and we know we need to take some steps. We know that we need to repent and yield and turn and change. We need, there are some things we need to do. Let's get up and do them. I might recommend practically speaking... You read the Gospel of John if you want to be invigorated again about what Christ's love looks like. Focus on the person of Christ. Read chapter 15 that I mentioned to you. A, a few books that you might check out. The Jesus I Never Knew or No Wonder They Call Him the Savior by Philip Yancey. Those are great books. One Perfect Life if you're a little more heady and you like more research by John MacArthur. I was just given the book. I haven't read it. Follow Me by David Platt. More, more recently. If you're not a reader, you might watch the Jesus film. If you're feeling really sober-minded, you might watch The Passion of the Christ. I don't recommend that to everybody. It's a strong movie. Write down the blessings in your life. Be reminded of how the Lord has loved you, what He's done. Thank Him for those things. Here, here's something that's kind of practical, too. Serve. Now sometimes it would be in the ideal world that we would be so filled up by the love of God that we can't help but go out and serve. That would be the ideal way that we serve. But sometimes it happens the other way. Sometimes we just do something hard that we don't want to do for somebody we may not even like. We just serve them. We just get it done. And after the fact, we get the satisfaction and the blessing and the joy. And here's, here's for me the kicker. When I'm serving somebody that I have a hard time with or a, in a difficult situation, I'm reminded this person represents me to God. Because I'm that person. I'm difficult and I'm moody. You know, I'm, I'm slow and I'm hard and sometimes I'm difficult to deal with. And God loves me so relentlessly and so faithfully and so tenderly. As I have loved you, son, 
Go love her. Go love him. And then I learn what it is to be loved by him, which then changes my ability to love someone else. It's pretty powerful. Get inspired by the love of God, by the person of Christ. Love. As I have loved you, you should love one another. We look behind at all you've done. We trace the path on which we've come. That path is strewn with evidences of the Lord's love. We're going to enter into a time of invitation in just a moment. If you have a decision that you've made or uh, you just like a time of prayer, uh, either by yourself at the altar or with one of us, we'd be happy to pray with you. If you don't mind, if you'll stand, I'll uh, open this time in prayer and then we'll think about His love. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, the fact that we can even bow our heads and still our minds for just a moment and know that you are there and you care is evidence of your love for us that you have made real. God, we thank you that in eternity past, you and the Son and the Spirit committed yourselves to our redemption, to offering the free gift of eternal life through the painful death, but yet the powerful resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So God, we want to reflect now on your love for us during this time of singing, and we invite you to um, just move in our hearts and draw us to him uh, in a deeper way, and that this time would be meaningful, and we pray it through him and by your spirit. Amen. Okay.